Yeah, so it's Cork against Dublin in the All-Ireland Football Final this weekend. The front cover of the Examiner dealing with defeat. Cork's Orla Finn on dominance and dynasties. There's also lots of stuff about uh, Martin O'Neill, the continuing fallout from the two weeks of chaos that uh, we've just lived through from an Irish football perspective. O'Neill defends production line, but how sound are Ireland's structures? Conor O'Dowda was doing the press yesterday and the, the line that most of the tabloids are going with is that like, oh look, we still respect Roy Keane. But everybody else is starting to ask questions about uh, coach education, the role of the FAI in all of this and um, Liam Mackey is making the point that now there are at least some options available for Martin O'Neill throughout the qualifying campaign by virtue of the fact that he had nobody fit to play in the game in Poland and now has found some stuff out about some players. Yeah, and like I think Mackie goes through some of the, the young potential talent that could be coming through over the next couple of years. Like there has been this argument levelled against O'Neill and Keane that they really only care about the current crop and they don't really <coughs> care too much about the future, which doesn't really make too much sense if Martin O'Neill has been around the game for as long as he has, that he doesn't value future uh, kind of earnings in terms of Irish success when it comes into the context of the present team. Because ultimately the present does depend on the future quite a bit when it comes to international football. And that should have been in stark reality and it should have been put right in front of him on, uh, on that night in Cardiff last week because of uh, the young talent they had at their disposal. So I don't think that's ne necessarily true. I think we can, see, we can expect to see a lot more fresh faces over the next year or so. The thing is, we don't know what's going to happen next month. If we lose both those games next month, those us officially mark the end of their tenure. All 15 of Limerick's All-Ireland final starters in running for the uh, PwC All-Star Awards and the Hurler of the Year shortlist. Keane Lynch is the uh, Limerick representative. Um, Mannion and Park Mannion and uh, Joe Canning are the other two. We'll talk about that a little bit later on as well, just kind of get into some of the details of that. But <coughs> um, it's interesting, obviously, that uh, the shortlist for Young Player of the Year, sorry, I didn't give you that. Dara Fitzgibbon, Kyle Hayes and Mark Coleman. So uh, two Cork and one Limerick. Kyle Hayes get it? Probably, yeah. You, you would, you'd expect him to, like, given his performance in the All-Ireland Final. Yeah, it was pretty good. It's uh, essentially his performance came at a time when Limerick won the All-Ireland. Despite the fact that actually the man who won the All-Ireland for Limerick technically was Shane Dowling, and uh, he's cons it's conspicuous by his absence he's there. He's the one Limerick player who could have had a shout and who doesn't. I don't remember all 15 starters from an All-Ireland Final. I uh, know it's nations before. Does it happen all the time? It's happened before. It happened with Tip a couple of years ago. Did it? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Was that the first time? I'm not sure. Was that a, a novel thing? But just because of it, it was recent, I, I do remember that. So I guess it's more unusual now, given we've seen more teams play more matches and there's a wider spread of form across the country. So I guess that's a huge achievement from Limerick to do it, given the season we've had. Kilkenny won a record nine in 2003, 83. 2009 and 2008. Don't know why I did 09 and 08 backwards. Um, but I, 83, 2000 and 2008. It's like a mystery voice from Wikipedia in my head. It's the voice of God. <coughs> uh, once Mary asked me to continue Michal's legacy, I couldn't say no. Three months after the death of their manager, Loud Ladies go to Croke Park on Sunday, determined to honour his memory. Loud manager Michal McKeown suffered a brain hemorrhage on the morning of their Leinster Junior Football Championship semi-final in June and died two days later after speaking with Michal's widow, Darren Bishop, in the inset, took over the role and has led them to the final. It's a remarkable story ahead of the uh, Junior All-Ireland Football Final at the weekend. Uh, O'Neill and FAI <coughs> in the dark over Rice plans. So this is the... Dan McDonald has this story about Declan Rice. Martin O'Neill has claimed he's still in the dark about Declan Rice's intentions. Um, I don't know any more than you do at this particular juncture. Honestly, I genuinely don't. There's no point in me commenting here positively or negatively until I get to talk to the people again. Which would suggest to me most of the speculation about him being close to a comeback, which is basically how the story has been spun in recent days, has been bunkum. He's going to meet his parents, though. And that actually, we're as far away from him saying yes as we ever were. Mm, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that at all. I think we're certainly nearing a decision. Why do you feel ho hopeful? What, like, uh, uh, hope being you want him to come back, right? I think we all probably, most of us, want him to uh, play for Ireland at this point. I just don't think it's going to happen. Well, for some of the things he said in the past, he clearly identifies with the country. He, there's clearly a large part of Declan Rice he wants to play for Ireland. Very much like a, in a, on a different plane to Jack Grealish. 
Like, I think we're getting sucked into the idea that this is just Jack Grealish all over again. It's not. There's a little more to it. And Martin O'Neill, uh, as has been reported as well this morning, is off to meet Declan Rice's parents to try and sort out the situation, to try and figure out uh, where his head is at in terms of reaching a decision. And I, like, I'd be quietly confident at this point that Martin O'Neill is going to be able to have some sway over that and try and inform them that, yes, international football is important in terms of your commercial future, but... Thank for Ireland can also achieve that goal of Ireland get good at football again. Now that is a that is a big if, and yeah. uh, that is that is a problem. The thing is, England are also improving. They're also getting a lot better. And you could, if you listen to, say, like just watching the Sunday supplement last week and hearing some of the press talk about Declan Rice, there is absolutely no guarantee he will ever get that England cap, and it may never never happen for him. Uh, now, he may look at, if you want to make a Jack Grealish comparison, you may look at Jack Grealish now and say, well, it took him a couple of years, but a bit of form and maybe looked after in the right way because of the high-profile nature of him being English now uh, helped him achieve that upturn in his trajectory. So Grealish will get his English cap one day, will Declan Rice, basically. There is a bit of uncertainty about that. Keane still has the support of the squad as the back page headline on the Times Ireland edition. O'Dowda denies rift between players and coach. Roy Keane still has the support of the entire Ireland squad, according to Callum O'Dowda and Aidan O'Brien. And these are two of the younger players, obviously, who are going to be mainstays of the squad, you would think, for the next while. This is um, despite the fact, obviously, that it's been reported um, from Stephen Ward's WhatsApp message that uh, Keane called Harry Arter an effing prick while uh, claiming that Keane and Walters nearly came to blows. I mean, it's hard to put too much store in what young players say in the press conference after or in like an impromptu press gathering in the aftermath of a, yeah, yeah, we still love the assistant manager. You know, I mean, it's not that different from like, if it's 100% true, yeah, of course, look, we're getting on grant. It's hard to tell, right? Yeah, well, he's not going to say Roy Keane is a shite assistant manager, is he? I mean, that would be like a perfect end to a fortnight of... Uh, he just says that. Yeah, what what did he even do? Put out the cones, shouts a bit, talks about winning all those Premier Leagues. Who does he think he is, Billy Big Balls? If you're going to say that about Roy Keane, the only safe place to do it is in a WhatsApp voice message. You don't say that in a press conference. Yeah, you, you can keep it in confidence with your friends who will definitely not screw you over and share it so that the world can hear what you really think. Yeah. Uh, there's a great piece by Andy McAvoy, um, who is an all star selector, talking about the omission of Shane Dowling. Basically saying that um, Dowling was very influential across the course of the championship and can probably feel a little bit hard done by that there is precedent for somebody getting an All-Star nomination in the past. And like, The point about the All-Star nomination is not that you get the All-Star, it's that you get to go on the night. Yeah. It's like, and the All-Star is a great night where uh, a massive jamboree of people come, have the crack, and then all go to coppers or wherever they can get into at like uh, three o'clock in the morning. They're all stars. They will get into coppers. Well, some of them, some of the nominees. Oh, sorry, nominees. You will definitely get into all uh, into coppers. And uh, some of the hurlers, you know, they you're an intermediate club player. You will definitely get into coppers. <coughs> well, okay. Um, apparently, uh, Owen McGrath in tip. Sorry, from Waterford in 07 was a sub all season, but had been so effective as a sub that they decided that he was worth uh, a nominee in the top 45 hurlers in the country for that year. I mean, when you put it like that, Darling probably is in the top 45 hurlers in the country in the last, in this calendar year, in terms of impact. Yeah, yeah like, I, I agree. I think. I was kind of thinking, like, look, it's, it's fair enough, you know, there was a couple of games where he didn't get off the bench at all. He, he basically won the semi-final and won the All-Ireland for them. Come the All-Ireland series, he was introduced after 58 minutes against Kilkenny, 56 against Cork and 55 against Galway. And sure, the Galway one had like 25 minutes of injury time. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And for a celebration as well, he deserves a celebration. An nomination. I mean, it, there should be a special award to get in there on the night. Best celebration of the year. Shane Dowling. Best celebration by Shane Dowling in an All-Ireland final to Come on. Like the... Is there a criteria nailed down in terms of best performance, most impactful, because if you put it down to most impactful, I don't think you can deny that Shane Dowling deserves to be in the top 45 hurlers of the year. If you talk about who put in the most minutes of greatness throughout the season, <coughs> then maybe you could make a case that Shane Dowling doesn't deserve to be there, but I think the, the former completely outweighs the latter there. And here's the thing, as far as I know, it's, it's a debate around the table as opposed to these are the criteria, it's works yeah. out of 10, and at the end of it you get a number and everybody goes, Jesus, those numbers don't really work for us, so... Um, well, Shane, Shane Dowling surely gets to go to the All-Stars, no? Does he not, does he not you, have an invitation would, would now? Would you, I mean, are you going to the PPIs? The PPIs, the, the Imro Awards. Are oh, you? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so, no, I don't, I'm not sure. 
Would you feel a bit like, oh, geez, I can't go? Not sure. Would you? <laughs> That's, you're, bra you're breaking my heart here. Do you know what I mean, though? Uh, it's a bit like... Yeah, of course I would. If there was if, if there was a ticket going, if, if Shane Dowling, if somebody says Shane Dowling does a ticket for the PwC All-Stars going, uh, Convention Centre, Dublin... Literally one of his teammates got... I mean, I hope he does go. It'd be good, it's a good night, you know? It's not literally every one of his teammates. It's just those people who started. That Actually, that is the thing that might rub salt in the wounds where John Kiley's like, no, we, you're... you're almost <clears throat> more important as a finisher rather than a starter, believe me. And then all the GEA intelligentsia who are actually sitting around that round table in a Croke Park boardroom are like, actually, no, you're not, Shane. So that must actually be uh, a bit of a, a kick in the teeth when in actual fact he was like one of their top five most important players in the semi-final and final. Can we go that far? Anthony Joshua's fighting in um, 10 days' time. Forget Fury, I'm the world number one, he says in the front of the Telegraph this morning. Um, I mean, they should just get these... Good fights on, right? Come on. Yeah, I, was, I was just trying to think. Yeah, like the Joshua fight in ten days' time. I completely forgot that that was happening. Me I too. Like I was just trying to think of the, the opponent there. It's Povetkin, isn't it? Yeah. Um, like that just tells you all you need to know about where that heavyweight kind of build up has gone and how staggered it's been and how much we're in kind of an impasse at the moment. <clears throat> just waiting, as you say for the big names to get it on. But you would expect 2019 to be one of the best years of heavyweight boxing we've seen. We thought 2018 was going to be, yeah. I mean, that's that's the, be like, that year. Um, but that's more down to Fury maybe not getting his act together. Fury's going to fight Wilder most likely in Vegas in early December, says Gareth A. Davis. Um, but, okay, so. so you got Fury is a lot fitter right now. Like, that is... Uh, then 12 months ago. Like, yeah, we, okay, we, fair we, enough. We may have, yeah. like, put that... Uh, but uh, is there, like... It, but then you've also got someone like Dillian White. He's had a really good year. Isn't isn't the possibility though that Anthony Joshua, like, what kind? What what's his fight against Povetkin going to be like? Probably what the last two Joshua fights have been like, where he's unspectacular, gets the job done, wins it on points. Does Povetkin go down? Maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure. Like. I think we're all going to look back on the Klitschko fight and maybe we're all kind of overrating how amazing that was from a Joshua perspective. Like, the people who dislike Anthony Joshua will say that Klitschko was well over the hill at that point. And maybe from what we've seen over his last couple of performances, there might be some credence in that argument. So does Anthony Joshua need to knock Povetkin out early to get back to his dominant ways, to get back to the, to the point where we looked at him like this invincible heavyweight he wouldn't be beaten for a decade? Because... He's certainly not looking invincible at the moment. No. And the, the discourse has changed dramatically around him where suddenly you've got a number of top heavyweights. And maybe the idea of the heavyweight division being so strong now is down to the fact that Joshua has come down rather than the fact that everybody else has come up to his level. Yeah, I mean, you want to see... You, stars make fights, obviously, but you want to see people with a similar, somewhat similar ability fighting against each other and kind of going at it. Yeah, like, uh, as Kevin Kilban always says, he doesn't care if it's a crap game as long as it's a close game sort of thing. So maybe that's the same thing when it comes to heavyweight boxing. Right. Um, that's me done. What have you got for us? Uh, we Trust Roy is the back of the Irish Daily Mail. You forgot your Rassing Post, actually. Oh, the Rassing Post. Uh, the, the most one. But what's, uh, what have you got there? Oh, yeah, Falcon Swoops and Kerry National. This is very annoying. Yesterday, I was in a meeting until about half four came out, <laughs> and uh, Kev was like, oh, I've got two for you for the 420 Listo, which is the national... He got first and third in our in our tipping group. I was like, "Oh, come on, come on!" So, uh, Doncaster Boost is la di da confirmed a runner in the uh, ledger. It's obviously Champions Weekend this weekend in uh, Ireland, and we're going to be broadcasting live from the Leperstown Inn on Friday night. Joe Schmidt's going to be there. John Small is going to be there, and Johnny Mert is going to be there. Johnny Ward's going to be there, and John Duggan might be there. So it's going to be Joe, Johnny, John, Johnny. John. <laughs> sure. United Nations. Why don't you just like, uh, let Joe present instead of you? <clears throat> new tournament gets positive response from uh, betting community. So the uh, UEFA's grand new project, the, Nation, the Nations League, made its debut over the weekend. And though it's far too early to tell whether it's going to be a smash hit, the initial reaction from the betting community has been cautiously optimistic. Uh, as soon as Harry Kane came out on Saturday mm. night and says the referee was shit, then we knew this was real. Then we knew this was a, a, a tournament worth getting behind. So... I've got one more for you. I've got the uh, the Irish news. Yeah, here it is. Mulholland's dreams on hold. Is there not a Mulholland drive joke that you could have made there? Uh, new Queen's boss making no secret of his down ambitions. Here you go. Back page of the Irish Daily Mail this morning is... Screw we trust you, Owen. 
Screw you, right? I'm t I, I can't wait. Yeah. The, uh, what, you can't wait for my vision to start yeah. deserting me? And they start putting tiny, tiny stuff up on the screen for you. 2020 feels pretty good, I must say. Uh, O'Dowda says players fully behind Keane. That's uh, Philip Quinn's story on the Callum O'Dowda quotes. Also, Schmeichel backs Jose to win Premier League. Manchester United legend Peter Schmeichel believes that club supporters need to be patient with Jose Mourinho. And he thinks he can win a Premier League title if he stays around for another season or so. Bland man says bland thing about nothing. Well, about a not-so-bland subject matter, so that's why you get onto the back page, isn't it? Uh, it's pretty bland, isn't it? He might at some point, if you know, he's given time, safe in the knowledge he's never going to be given the opportunity or the time to stick around to do it. It's nonsense. Schmeichel, Schmeichel's a blowhard. Do you think so? Like, a bland blowhard. The worst type. Can you be a bland blowhard? Is that not a bit of an oxymoron? Uh, you can shout about stuff and you can gesticulate wildly about stuff and then when people go, oh, what did you say? Just screaming the word vanilla from the rooftop. Exactly. That's a good description of it, Peter Schmeichel. Uh, back page of the Herald is O'Neill targets nations. Uh, Ireland boss confident team can get back and hunt with Arthur returning to the fold. I just want to keep that shirt, says Aidan O'Brien. Uh, back page of the Mirror is why Jose missed both uh, United or Boat. United didn't convince 45 million pound days that they were better than Bayern. And uh, belt up Tyson, Joshua laughs off Fury's number one claim, as we were just speaking about. Uh, back page of the Sun this morning is piece by piece, rebuilding job for O'Neill. You've also got 15 limits of Shane on the top of the back page of the Sun. That is a snub for Shane Dowling in the PwC All-Star nominations. Back page of the Irish Daily Star is rice to see you. O'Neill set to meet Declan's family. That is the story we were just speaking about. So can he persuade Declan Rice via his parents to play for Ireland once again? It's a Paul Lennon story, so obviously very well sourced. Uh, the hugely talented midfielder is also keen on remaining with his country, despite a June summit with England boss Gareth Southgate. Well, that's, like, I mean, different, right? Yeah. Is it starting to... Is it starting to illuminate the path for you now that Declan Rice is walking, what? aka back to the shores? Well, now, why leave in the first place? What's that about? I didn't leave. What? Why bring this whole thing up? Oh, I've got a, I've got a bit of a hammer. Because was there not a little bit of trouble in the camp that he was supposed to be in? But like, is that not fair enough for him to say? Like, if Harry Arthur, I'm going to play, the, just not at the minute, right? Just not at the minute. I'm, I'm committed to Ireland. I'm going to play. Just not at the minute. And if my first game happens to coincide with the first game that doesn't involve Roy Keane, then that's just a coincidence. Well, uh, well, I, like, then say that. Don't say, I want to play for England. Did he say that? Or, I'm thinking about playing for England. He didn't say, I want to play for England. He says he's just weighing it up. And has the story got legs to the point where David Gold, talking to Declan Rice and turning his head, just wasn't a thing? Like West Ham maybe have got an unfair rap in all of this. I'm sorry. I, you can give West Ham whatever rap you want, but it ain't ever going to be unfair. But maybe it's just not true. Maybe David Gold never had that conversation with Declan Rice. The saying, concerted effort from Rice and from Pellegrini and from the fact that, like, uh, Gareth Southgate, like this, there was no conversation at any point ever, ever, between any of these people. Like, certainly Rice, uh, certainly Pellegrini and Gold, like, Gold said... Pellegrini will turn him into an England international. Mm. That's what he said. Like, one of your jobs here, man who works for me, is to do this thing that I want. And the manager's going to go, I don't give a shit about you, David Gold. Like, who are you? You can't sack me. So is he? <laughs> we will see. I, uh, maybe I'm giving David Gold uh, too much credit here. Maybe he's, uh, like, maybe there's nice elements of David Gold as well as... Uh, some not so nice elements. He sold Declan Rice, though, it would be just pure evil. Uh, back page of The Guardian then this morning, it's an interesting story. It is not working. Test rugby facing ruin. World body fears for future of the game. So this is Augustine Pichot speaking uh, and R Robert Kitson reporting that uh, the whole world rugby model is just completely messed up at the moment. It's not working. The sport is regressing on an international level and the reason and the way we can fix this is by compressing international breaks or the test season, so to speak, into one big window, a.k.a. July is what they're suggesting. So get rid of the November internationals, get rid of the June internationals and just make one big international test season in July. And so the response from the clubs has been like, oh, great, we can play club rugby in June. And he's saying you're playing, you're making your players play too much rugby and so they're, they're getting absolutely flogged. And I know as a player that that's too much rugby for me to play. Like, they haven't worked out a solution. The other aspect of this is that they met last year, um, or maybe it's 18 months ago, in San Francisco and hammered out a deal and said, right, this is the new global calendar, we're all grand, we're all committed up to 2023, 
and already he's saying we need to meet again and make sure that a new deal is in place to take us for 10 years up from uh, the next World Cup on. So the deal that they did has already broken down. There are too many disparate groups in rugby who have different agendas. The English Premiership group, um, they were subject of a takeover bid by a VC firm who used to own Formula One. And they turned that down this week. Um, and they want something very different from what the RFU want and from what the unions want. But even the unions at international level don't really know what they want because they can't agree with each other because they've all stabbed each other in the back so much when it comes to uh, World Cup bids, uh, refereeing committees, money being spent from uh, TV deals. There's, so there's the nest of vipers at the top. There's the nest of vipers at club level who are fighting with each other and then outwardly fighting with the unions. And in the middle, the players are getting played, concussed, beaten up, broken, played, concussed, beaten up, broken, and it's like, it's a bit of a mess. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it, that the nest at the top that you talk about probably cares more about the grassroots level of rugby well, than the nest in the middle, oh, than, the, than the clubs. Yeah, totally. The clubs, it's not the club's job, as they see it, to foster grassroots rugby. They might want an academy, but academies are really expensive. Yeah. Like really, really expensive. And short-term games coaches, are far more attractive. And you don't even know if any of those guys are going to be any good. Much better to have, like, the national team hive off all the best players, pay for underage coaching, and then produce them to you as fully-fledged professionals that you can steal, flog, take, and uh, profit off the back of. Now, they're not doing a very good job profiting, profiting off the back, so um, in England there's been a fetish about the club owners know the future of the game, and we need to back the club owners because, because they give access to uh, certain key rugby journalists to the stories, and they tell them what's going on, so therefore those stories end up being the one... What a ridiculous becomes, notion. The, rugby, the, the dominant rugby narrative... But actually, those clubs are some of the worst-run sports organisations in world sport. They're, almost none of them are profitable, and almost none of them have a, a brilliant track record of looking after and, and uh, minding their players. So, but imagine if you said that about any other sport, where it's like Stan Kroenke and Roman Abramovich know what's best for the future of football. Like, it's just a completely nonsense notion. Say it about any of the NFL owners that they care about the future of American football. Like, that is ridiculous. I'm not even sure where... I hadn't heard that before until you said that, that there is this idea that the club owners really care about the future of uh, rugby in England. Because that just can't be the case. Those two things can't coexist. When you want to profit off a sports team, you can't care about the grassroots. All you've got to care about is what is the bottom line. And if that means, as you say, flogging your players, concussing your players, whatever it may be, putting them out week after week after week, putting bums in seats every single week, and that's all you care about. Like That can't coexist with things. And maybe rugby needs to face up to the idea that that will never coexist, that you need to find a way for these two things to balance themselves out. Football, to a certain extent, is living in that reality now. And ultimately, rugby... And everything they do, if they want to be successful, if they want to be a far more popular sport in the world than they currently are, well, you could look at a lot worse models than football internationally. But again, with the, the numbers on the ground there, that's a very different animal.